It Screams, written by Sage of the Forlorn Path. Disgusting, humid, unmoving and under just the right pressure from the bloated storm clouds, the air felt viscous and fetid, like drinking a stagnant puddle in a dusty crawl space. The moisture clung to the man's skin, finding every bit of dirt and filth and huddling around it like a growing fungus. Even after showering the previous night, the humidity made him feel he was glazed with a paste of dried sweat and dead skin. His hands felt like they'd been running through unwashed hair, left greasy and clammy. At the moment, a bar of soap and some running water would bring him more joy than a stack of gold bricks. The man was out in the woods of northern Maine, having just moved to the area and wanting to familiarize himself with the land. It was late autumn and the sky of black clouds had just sprayed the forest with a thin drizzle before he left his home. The unfamiliar trees around him were blackened by the moisture, their obsidian bark visible through the webbing of moss that cocooned them. Mist hung above the ground, unchallenged, not even the slightest breeze present to dispel it. The woods were silent, every creature hiding. Even the drops of water on the pine trees stubbornly clung to their needles, as if afraid of falling and breaking the silence. Above the man's head, the branches of the trees, strung with age, wove a net to try to keep the forest floor eclipsed in darkness. But down below, the effects of time could be seen. Every tree limb within his vision was dead, starved of sunlight. The jagged spires remained extended, reaching out despite their wood, now rotting. The man was no novice to the wilderness. As a manor, he had been around trees all his life, but he had never before stood in a forest like this. It felt primeval, an ancient bastion that existed beyond the laws of man or God indifferent to the passing eons, as if suspended in its own pocket of time. It felt like he was the first to walk through these woods, and perhaps ever. This was a level of solitude that chilled him, for it was the farthest he had ever been from civilization. But there was more to it than that. He felt like he had entered a realm that was not truly part of nature. Whether it be a steaming jungle or a lifeless desert, he would feel more at home, more in tune with the world than he was here. He came out of the woods and into a field, glad to escape the shadows of the trees. He looked up at the sky, at the dark clouds that claimed dominion over the land and refused the light of the sun. There were only a couple hours left of sunlight. He needed to head home. These woods chilled his blood during the day. He didn't dare remain outside during the night. But he stayed at that spot, at the very edge of the field looking back into the darkness of the trees on the other side. He wanted to get home. He wanted to get home and lock his doors, cover his windows, and hide beneath the covers until the weather cleared, but his mind wouldn't let him move from that spot. It was like he was trying to remember something or figure out a problem, and moving at all would disrupt his focus. There was something his subconscious wanted him to realize. He was surrounded by variables, all of which had come together to grade something. But what? The weather, the light, the moisture, the temperature, the time of year, they all culminated in something, something that some part of him was aware of and recognized. A shiver rippled through his skin as he figured it out. In essence, he knew that something bad was going to happen. It was going to happen here and now. This spot, this very second, it was like a darkness was gathering and would manifest into some incarnation of tragedy. He knew that anything could happen, that any number of unspeakable horrors could take place in the darkness of these trees, and the world would never know, as if the blood of a million people could be shed in this forest, and the light of the sun would never shine on even a drop. Would he trip and sprain his ankle? Was a rabid animal going to tear his throat out? Would some deranged killer bury a rusty knife in his back? Or would something that existed outside of human knowledge occur? Something bad was going to happen. He knew it. This place was cursed. His whole body shook, but he could not take a step, paralyzed by a fear that he didn't understand. Movement shook him from his trance. He saw it in the trees across the field. There was no wind. The air as still as the breath in the corpse's lungs. But the spindly branches swayed and bent. 
There was something there. He could see it. He did not need his eyes to see it. It was invisible to the gelatin spheres with their quivering irises, but the mind's eye could see it, like he was looking through an image etched in glass. Even when he blinked, he could see it in the darkness, seeing it with the eyes of his soul, and he could see it looking back at him. A new fear took him, a terror that he had never felt before, but dwarfed every life experience. It was an older terror, something more than simply instinctive. It was primordial. It was universal, born from a knowledge that was written in even the most undeveloped strand of DNA. This thing, whatever it was that he was looking at, existed in total opposition to life itself. Its identity was that of blasphemous sentience that did not belong in this world. Even the bacteria in the man's gut shivered in revulsion to this thing's presence. Had they the ability, they would be wailing like infants during a thunderstorm. They felt it, just as he did, that whatever this thing was, its existence, was wrong. From his racing heart and seething pressure, blood began to run from this man's nose, and when the first drop fell from his lips, the creature snapped him out of his stupor with a noise. It was a blood-curdling scream, a woman's, like she was being stabbed with a rusty knife. The voice echoed through the wilderness, sounding so purely human. But the fact that the beast had made such a sound terrified the man beyond words. Shaken by that scream, he turned and ran back into the woods, sprinting harder and faster than ever in his life. Almost as soon as he started running, he could sense it behind him, chasing him like a hungry predator. It did not leave rhythmic footfalls, rather it would spontaneously thrash through the fallen leaves and underbrush, as if falling in and out of sync with reality as it moved. But every minute or so, it would give another bone-rattling scream, as if the man was running from something being gruesomely murdered. There was no clear path in the man's mind. Adrenaline had robbed him of any sort of mental map, leading him back to his home. Instead, he was simply reacting to the ground in front of him, going wherever it looked like he could cross easily. He avoided anything that could slow him down or drain his strength, aiming for only open areas and going downhill. To the man, the trees around him didn't feel mindlessly incapable of understanding what was going on. Rather, they felt utterly indifferent, as if turning away eyes that they didn't have, bystanders to the nightmare that he was trapped in. His vision was hindered by tears in his eyes, and the presence of this abomination, all courage and mental fortitude built from experiences in his life, had been erased, leaving him crying like an abandoned child. He could feel the malice in the entity, a mix of sadistic hunger and a bottomless hatred. It did not breathe, but he still felt a breath on the back of his neck. The man did not want to die, not by the hands of this thing. He no longer feared death, as long as it was anywhere but here. Running along the edge of the steep hillside, his foot slipped on the wet leaves on the ground. He fell, rolling down the cliff without any way of stopping himself. He hit multiple trees as he slid beating and bloodying him but unable to overcome his inertia and save him. Finally, he reached the bottom and landed in a creek. His forehead struck an exposed stone, cutting his face and leaving him disoriented, but fear wouldn't let him rest. He forced himself to his feet and scrambled up the other side. Once upon stable footing, he resumed running. His face was covered in blood and the frigid water of the creek was carried in every fiber of his clothes but he continued running. He no longer knew if the beast was still after him. Rather, his rattled brain sensed it everywhere. Even if it were to scream in his ear, he wouldn't hear it over his own heart racing. His breathing was haggard, his lungs feeling like they were filled with broken glass, and his steps were unbalanced and awkward. His body was at its limits, but fear pushed him forward. He lost track of time as he ran, the forest around him never ending every tree looking exactly like the ones around it. Finally, his strength gave out and he collapsed. Cold and exhaustion had left him half dead, but the fear within him wouldn't let him lose consciousness. Finally, his heart slowed just enough for him to hear another scream. It sounded like someone was being slaughtered in a horror movie, but it was off in the distance. Had he escaped the beast? Had it lost track of him? That small glimmer of hope restored some of his reasoning. 
His head injury still muddled his thoughts, but he was beginning to think clearly. He slowly pushed himself up, checking his surroundings. The sky was darkening, and soon he would be totally blind. But even in the shadows of the woods, he saw something unusually large and dark. It didn't look natural. Wait, was that a house? A few sparks of energy crackled in him, some of his stamina restored with hope, acting as a crutch for his exhausted body. He forced himself back onto his feet and staggered closer. He was right. It was a house built on the hillside, but the closer he got, the less sense it made. It was a two-story house, but it looked dilapidated, and there were no power lines. It had a front porch with an overhanging roof and two forward-facing windows on the second floor, making it almost look like a skull with its mouth hanging open. He had no idea how long ago it was built, but judging from the rickety pickup truck parked next to it, it was old. There were no signs of life from what he could see, no lights or noise, but there was something on the windows. The man shivered, not from the autumn air or his wet clothes, but from the realization that the windows were splashed with blood. On the left, second floor window, a lone handprint was pressed into the blood. What truly scared the man was how small the handprint was. Had the people here been killed by what was chasing him, or was it something else altogether? Forget it. Once he got to a place with service, he'd call the cops and let them figure it out. He limped over to the truck. It was even older than he was, but judging by the amount of leaves and pine needles strewn across it, it had been sitting in the spot for only a few days. However, upon searching the cab, he couldn't find any keys. There was only one place they could be. The man looked at the house and shuddered. Whatever had happened in there, he didn't want to see it, but he had no choice. He grabbed an old flashlight from the glove compartment and stepped onto the front porch. Up close, this place looked like it had been made completely by hand, probably even without power tools. The man knocked on the door and heard nothing inside. With a deep breath to give himself strength, he turned the rusted doorknob and the wooden slab swung open. He stepped inside and shined the flashlight on the interior of the house, feeling himself getting sick from the side. The first floor of the house was a single room, the floor littered with several bodies and various pieces of others. In this sealed house, the metallic stench of their shed blood was overpowering, along with their heinous odor of voided bowels and the vapors of decay. All of the furniture in the house was made of carved wood from the forest, and either animal hides or some kind of fabric and stuffing from the bygone era. The walls were lined with shelves, each decorated with leather-bound books and various pieces of animals either mummified or preserved in mason jars. The man shined his flashlight on the floor and shuddered. A pentagram had been painted with blood, with a candle stationed at each corner. In the center was a ball of fur, likely a dead animal. Revulsion overtook the man, but he was too terrified to give in to the squeamishness. He shut and locked the door behind him and covered the windows with mud made from the ashes from the fireplace to make sure his pursuers didn't see the light he was carrying. With as little physical contact as possible, he checked the bodies for the keys to the truck, but came up empty. He then searched the rest of the first floor, including the colonial-style kitchen. Night had fallen, and he had given up. Even if he did find the keys to the truck, he didn't want to be out there in the darkness. It would be better to wait until morning. Hopefully when there would be sunlight. Resigned to his fate, the man went to work on building a fire in the stone hearth. With some dusty matches and dry firewood stacked by the door, he managed to get a fire going. After the day he had, the warmth and the light of the fire was a comfort beyond words. Upon feeling the heat on his hands and his face, it was like the exhaustion and chill he had been ignoring up until now enveloped him. Now he could dry his clothes and warm himself up, but the fire also made him nervous. What if the beast smelled the smoke and came here? What if some of the light managed to pass through the windows or door? He sat there for a long while, simply staring into the flames. Even without a refrigerator, the kitchen held some preserved food, but he wasn't even in the mood for eating. Despite his exhaustion, it was hard for him to work up an appetite when surrounded by corpses and forced to bask in their stench. Upstairs, there were probably beds for him to sleep in, but he didn't dare go up there. 
He didn't want to leave the warmth and the security of the fire. He didn't want to touch the filthy sheets that these backwoods savages slept in. And most of all, he didn't want to find the remains of whoever left the small handprint on the upstairs window. He would be content to simply sleep on the floor by the fire, if he could even sleep at all. His thoughts always drifted back to the dead bodies surrounding him. What the hell were these people doing? What kind of evil ritual were they into? That pentagram, had they used it to summon the beast from the woods? Was that animal in the center a sacrifice? From the looks of it, whatever they summoned, it turned on them. What on earth had they unleashed? His blood turning to a cold slurry, the man spun around and looked to the windows. There, out on the porch, something was tapping on the glass. Even though the ash smeared across the window, he could see it. A shadow darker than the night itself. It had found him. He scrambled to his feet just as the door burst open. It stood there, staring at him. All the fear that the man had felt before came rushing back. His body shivering and tears falling from his eyes. No, please. Anything but this. He didn't want to die here, for this house to be his tomb. The beast rushed towards him and before the man could move, he felt himself cut. He felt his flesh torn and his blood spilling out. He screamed in pain and terror and fell to the floor. With his life fading, he stared at the horror standing over him. Before closing his eyes, the beast screamed, its voice sounding exactly like his own. Mannequins Written by Cold Commando. We all grow up hearing the stories of things that go bump in the night. The man with the hook for a hand. Bloody Mary. The list goes on. We grow up hearing these stories and putting them into the back of our minds. We use our rationale to weed out what is true, and what is just folklore. I used to think the same way, until I went. There. Before I go any further, I'd like to note that we had a very different kind of hobby we enjoyed. We would research places on the internet that were abandoned, or hell, if we were lucky, possibly haunted, and we would explore them. We always had a great thrill exploring the unknown, looking into places that society had left behind to rot. Now, returning to my story. I was 18 at the time, and I was with my two friends, Eric and Paul. It was Saturday night, and we decided to go on one of our adventures. I told my friends about a place we didn't explore yet. A few towns over, there was an abandoned factory. Strangely, even the amount of research I put into this place, I could not find a single thing about its history besides the address. There was no information on what it used to be, no ghost stories, no records, absolutely nothing. This seemed strange, but cool. It kind of gave me the thought of possibly uncovering some interesting information myself. We all piled into my car and followed the GPS to the destination. The GPS said that the building was off the road a ways. We looked out the window and saw nothing but trees. I assumed that the factory was deep in the woods, but this didn't faze any of us because we were so used to exploring the darkest and creepiest parts of the world. As we started to cut through the trees, I shined my flashlight a ways and found the factory up ahead. It was huge, overgrown with trees and foliage. It must have been about three stories high, and all the windows were either busted or boarded. We hit the jackpot. The three of us proceeded into the derelict structure and put on our respirators. Safety first, right? There was junk everywhere. Cans, old motors, trinkets of a different era, way before mine. As we found more items, we came to the conclusion that this used to be some sort of automotive factory. As we continued deeper into the building, I noticed something felt wrong, like a nauseating feeling of wrongness just swept my body like a wave. I stopped for a moment, and Eric asked, what's wrong? Not wanting to sound like a wussy, I just waved him off, and we kept walking. Towards the center of the building, there was a set of stairs. This place was creepy enough, without a staircase that only goes down. I'd never felt this feeling before, but I actually didn't want to go down there. I shined my light down the steps and stared for a moment. All there was, 
was silence. Come on, you guys. You're acting like a bunch of freaking wussies. I remember Paul saying, He led first. Me and Eric followed close. We finally hit the bottom, and to my unnerving surprise, there was an arm of a mannequin laying on the ground. I thought to myself, what would something like this be doing here? The feeling instantly got worse. We cautiously scanned the rooms with our lights, the beams illuminating the dust, or whatever was in the air. With the rooms illuminated by our flashlights, it was obvious that there really wasn't anything amazing down here, just more motors and junk. We were about to turn around and head back up, until I noticed something behind what appeared to be a large boiler. So I walked up to it, and it was a door. It was very short, about half my height, and was covered in rust. I slowly opened the door and stepped inside. Without thinking, I walked forward, intrigued, yet horrified. I turned around and shined my light back into the room I came from, and my friends were missing. The door then shut. There was no handle, no way out. I was terrified. I couldn't even think straight. I banged on the door. I screamed for my friends, but nothing happened. I turned around and shined my light. What I found was an old rusted ladder leading down into a dark hole. Clearly, there was nothing I could do but go down and hope that there was a way out. A horrible smell came from the hole. I proceeded down the ladder and I noticed that every 10 feet, the brick shaft I was descending would look more decrepit and dirty than it initially was. It seemed unnatural, but then I finally hit the bottom. The smell got progressively worse. The floor was flooded up to my ankles in murky water. I shined my light forward, and my beam didn't hit the other end of the room. It was huge. I had to be dreaming, because how could this be under an automotive factory? The deeper I moved into the room, the more mannequin parts I saw. Heads, arms, legs, everything. Some had red liquid, dripping from the eyes and mouths. Even deeper, there were mannequins that were standing, some missing arms and heads. They got more frequent as I kept walking. As I walked even deeper, there were more intact mannequins, the red liquid still dripping from their faces. I began to panic. The more mannequins I passed, the closer they got. They just kept closing in on me. I eventually hit a wall where there was a rusted door. Without thinking, I burst through the door and ended up outside the factory. I was standing behind the building. Before I could turn around and see what happened, the door was already shut. I didn't even attempt to second guess what I saw by opening the door. I just wanted to go home. I walked back to my car and drove off. I was so drained that I wasn't even concerned about my friends. They probably called for a ride. I noticed that I hadn't seen many cars. I knew it was late, but actually, I didn't see one car the entire ride back. I arrived home. There were no cars in the driveway. This was very odd because both of my parents never stayed out that late. It was still pouring rain. I ran to the porch to avoid getting soaked. I went to turn the knob. I noticed it was already unlocked. I got that nauseating feeling I had at the factory. I needed sleep. I cautiously entered the house, dropping my gear and climbed up the steps. I went to flip on the lights, but nothing happened. The storm probably blew out the power. I walked to my parents' room. The door was slightly ajar. It slowly opened with a loud creaking noise. I shined my flashlight into the room and saw two mannequins standing behind their bed. These ones were different, though. They both had large, sinister-looking smiles running across their faces. Mannequins don't look like that. I panicked. I ran from my room and slammed the door. My heart was pounding. I began to sweat. I heard my closet door open. I turned around and felt my heart sink into my stomach. I saw a mannequin standing in the closet. It had Eric's skin stretched over its white body, blood dripping, his face crudely pinned to the mannequin's head. There were dark holes where his eyes and mouth would have been. The head turned towards me and said in Eric's voice, Curiosity killed the cat. His mouth moved as he uttered the words. The limbs also began to rotate, ripping the flesh as it did so. I then heard a loud ringing in my ear. 
My head was pounding and I felt the nausea return. I threw up and blacked out. I woke up to the sight of my two friends' faces. We were still inside the basement of the factory. Whoa, easy man, Eric said. You blacked out. Looks like you hit your head pretty hard. I eventually sat up and began to tell them about the room behind the boiler, the mannequins and my confrontation with the one wearing Eric's skin. They were confused, so I got up and walked behind the large boiler to show them the door. It was gone. The Forbidden Forest No author There is a legend in my hometown about a patch of woods with an ominous vibe attached to it. The place is known as the Forbidden Forest. Several legends surround the woods, mainly originating from ancient Native American stories. It is said that these woods were considered to be sacred grounds on which the portal to the afterlife could be found deep in the heart of the forest. This portal was said to take the shape of a perfectly carved rock with a color similar to the color of obsidian Many of the particular tribes of the area were buried within the confines of the woods. Entering outside of times of burial was considered to be a transgression into the peaceful rest of the dead. As kids, we were told there was a boogeyman who haunted the grounds. Much like classic boogeyman myths, the boogeyman was said to stalk the woods, looking for bad kids who ran away from home. Of course, as kids, we believed this magnificent lie Though what was true was far worse than the classic stories. There were also rumors of it being a sort of place in which people would go to die, and to end their own lives due to the rather ominous reputation the woods have, with it also being quite a distance from the center of town. As a grown-up, I garnered interest in this place as I attempted to learn more about the place we were barred from going. As an adult, I did not believe in the silly illogical stories of the boogeyman or forest demons. Plus, I thought it would be pretty neat to take pictures of this forbidden zone. I entered the forest during a pleasant autumn day. The trees were beginning to change, the smell of pine still fresh in the air. When I stepped into the forest, all I could hear was the chirping of the birds singing their usual song. Beneath my feet, twigs and sticks cracked. The afternoon sun cut through the citrus-colored leaves. I was taken aback by the beauty of this serene sight laid out before my eyes. I whipped out my camera and took several shots of this beautiful moment. I continued further into the forest along a kindly laid out trail. I thought it was strange how such a trail could be created in a place with the reputation these woods have. I figured it must have been for those who were suicidal, given the fact that I began to notice signs stating that Life is worth living, and if you need help, please call this number. I continued into the forest, taking in the sights of nature. With no one around except for the birds and the bees, I felt at peace. The ominous vibe of the forest seemed to dissipate the further I went in. Further along into my track, I noticed something fascinating. I saw an overhang of a particularly tall rock. Next to the tall rock, there was a cave entrance. On the side of the rocks was a carving and a writing that seemed quite foreign to me. The writing was accompanied by pictographs of what seemed to be worshippers. Next to the figure, there seemed to be what appeared to be some kind of beast. I assumed that this was a Native American origin, and perhaps the origin for the urban legends of the boogeyman slash demons. Once again, I whipped out my camera to take pictures of this wonder. I began to wonder if anyone else knew about this. But alas, I continued. My curiosity drove me to continue as I entered the cave, excited to see what wonders could possibly lie inside. With my cell phone flashlight app, I perused into the cave. Entering the cave almost felt like a sin or a crime. I began to think to myself that perhaps I should not enter the cave, as I am sure this is considered holy ground. However, my curiosity got the best of me, and I continued. After five minutes of perusing, I began to notice an almost overpowering scent. The scent was almost as if it were rotting food. To my left and right, I also noticed old torches that I assumed could be lit again. I took out my lighter and lit the torches. 
I noticed about 20 feet ahead of me, a hole with stairs that seemed to spiral downwards. I perused over to the stairs as that strong smell continued to hover all around me. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I noticed that the area was well lit with torches. It was almost as if someone had been here within the past 24 hours. This was further supported as the ground was covered in mud, and within the mud, there were signs of someone going further into the bowels of the cave. The hairs on my skin began to rise, and my legs began to turn into jelly. I began to ponder the possibility of leaving here. However, I knew I had gotten myself too far in to turn back now. I began to follow the tracks in the mud, eventually reaching to what seemed to be a large cavern. All around me, I saw torches and cave paintings. It was an amazing sight to behold. There was another large hole in the center. I took several more pictures of the inside of this cavern. I noticed the smell had gotten a lot stronger now, and it was practically unbearable. I began to dwell on the thought of what the smell could possibly be. Unfortunately, I found the answer to my question. I looked down into the hole where the pungent scent was emanating from. There I found the answer to my question. Deep in what seemed to be a 40-foot hole, were decomposing human corpses. Most were freshly killed, as some had their skin still on. The corpses all had their entrails hanging out of their abdomens. All the corpses had wounds that were cut to precision in such a way that it looked like a clean kill. I nearly vomited at the sight of what I just saw. What was also strange was the way in which my camera died shortly after the discovery of the grisly scene. Considering I could not take pictures of what I saw, I turned around and ran out of that cave hoping that whoever was responsible for this would not find me. After leaving the cave in the forest, I immediately went to the police about this discovery. Considering my lack of evidence, I was surprised to see that they had entertained my request to examine that cave. In the next hour, a police force with me alongside them entered the cave and back into the cavern where I found the bodies. However, the bodies were gone. There was no evidence that anything had occurred at all. No gore, no blood, nothing. The police left, perhaps thinking that I was crazy. Regardless, I know what I saw was true. I just hope I'm not the next victim. Marrow Written by Hallowed Stone I'm not much for ghost stories. I even used to be scared of the characters set up in scary movies. I've grown out of it by now, and I've even come to enjoy some scares now and again, but I don't actually hear many ghost stories, like the ones you tell at night around a campfire. Many of my friends are as easily scared as I once was, so I just don't get the opportunity. Even when I do hear one, I know it's a bunch of made up crap. It's often cheesy, boring, and barely even gives me the chills. Ghost stories aren't real after all, right? There is one story, however, that I remember to this day, and I become more and more unsure of myself. I try to assure myself that it's just a story, but fear has a way of snuffing out rational thought. I'll explain as best as I can remember. Back when I was in high school, a little over four years ago, a friend of mine, Kevin, decided to host a party since his parents were out of town. It wasn't anything special. There were about 12 of us or so in total, and there wasn't any drinking or anything like that. His parents had mounted cameras all around the house, which they checked frequently, so he never could have gotten away with it, even if he tried. If there had been drinking, I probably wouldn't be here telling you this story. A booze-induced story wouldn't worry me. As the party continued past 11 p.m., Someone thought it would be fun to tell ghost stories. Being one of the few chances I got, and since I had recently gained an interest in the paranormal, I eagerly joined. Everyone sat in a circle, and since it was Kevin's party, he chose the storytellers. After two ghost stories, he chose Randy. I didn't know Randy. I don't think he even went to the same school as the rest of us. He and I just had Kevin as a mutual friend. At first, Randy refused. I remember him having an odd expression on his face as he declined. I wasn't sure what it was at the time, but looking back, 
it looked like the feeling of emptiness. It took a bit of convincing, courtesy of the other guests, but Randy finally agreed to tell us a story. Oddly enough, though, Randy made a request. If I tell this story, they could never leave this room, he said. Sorry, Randy. We were all taken aback by this request, but Randy insisted we never tell a soul. We eventually agreed. Much to our dismay, he then proceeded to tell his story of the night he watched his mother, an older brother, die right in front of him. Randy used to live in the rural part of Minnesota, which, if I recall, was somewhere in Clay County. He lived in one of those lone houses you see on the freeway near the woods, but they aren't on the farm. Those houses are just there, isolated from the rest of the world. In these places, there may be less than 10 people for several miles, and the only other thing in sight is fields or trees. One summer night when Randy was seven, he woke up at around three in the morning. Apparently, it was normal. He would often wake up in the middle of the night due to the hot weather in the summer, since his family couldn't afford to install air conditioning. All he had to do was get a glass of water to cool down, and he could fall asleep again. He went to the kitchen and got his water, leaving all the lights off so he wouldn't wake anyone up. He didn't mind. He wasn't afraid of the dark like his sister was, even though she was older than him. On his way back to his room, he happened to see something out the corner of his eye. Whatever he saw, it was outside. He assumed it was just a wild animal, but he felt uneasy for some reason, so he decided to turn the porch light on to check. It would just be a second. Hopefully the light wouldn't wake up his siblings, whom he shared a room with at the front of the house. He turned on the light. Standing in his front yard, he saw a woman in her twenties, covered in blood. She was skinny, almost starving, but she had numerous large boil-like grouse, each as big as a baseball, all over her body. Her limbs seemed broken in several places, and she was wearing only a tattered t-shirt and ripped jeans. Even though she could barely stand, she didn't move. She just stood there, facing the house. Randy was scared, but he knew she needed help. He woke up his older brother, his brother was a high school football player, so he was strong, but he wasn't just a jock. He got better grades than anyone on his team. Randy assumed he would know what to do. They looked outside at the broken woman, who just stood there, struggling to stay on her feet. Randy's little sister had also awoken and was also looking outside at the woman. Is that lady okay? She asked. Call dad, I'll go get mom. Randy's brother told them. Randy's father was apparently a police officer for a nearby town and was working the night shift. Randy's sister volunteered to call their father. As Randy stayed in his room and watched from the window, he saw his mom and brother, who held a shotgun, looking around for someone who might have caused this woman injuries, approach the girl. His mother gasped in horror after seeing the woman and rushed to apply first aid. Randy's brother stayed close by. As Randy's mother approached the woman, Randy saw the woman pull out what looked like a hunting knife. He didn't have time to open the window to warn her. The woman lashed at Randy's brother with unbelievable force, especially considering the shape she was in. He fell to the ground, holding his bleeding throat. Randy's mother shrieked and turned to run, but she tripped. The woman turned, looking as if she might collapse unable to hold herself up. Randy's mother backed up in a desperate crab walk, eventually turning around and crawling on her hands and knees. She wasn't fast enough. The woman tackled her, then stabbed Randy's mother just below the ribs on her right side as Randy's mother screamed in agony. The woman slowly stood up. Randy's mother had stopped screaming and could do nothing but whimper, tears streaming down her face. The woman dropped the knife, turned away, and fell forward to the ground. The large boils on her body started opening up, and several small creatures started crawling out of them. The creatures were each about the size of growth that they had emerged from. They were pitch black, scraggly, and had bright red eyes. The creatures, as quickly as they left the woman, crawled inside Randy's mother through the stab wound. Once all the creatures were inside her, she slowly stood up, struggling to move, and still crying. 
She picked up the girl's knife, then grabbed Randy's brother by the wrist. She looked at Randy through the window, forming the words, help, with her mouth, but no sound came out. She dragged Randy's brother and the dead woman's body away, escaping before Randy's sister had finished her call with her dad. Nobody was quite sure what to make of the incident, but officially, it was described as a kidnapping. Randy never heard more than this, until almost four years later. Randy's dad had started drinking to deal with this growing depression, which didn't go over well with his boss, the sheriff. When he was put on leave to deal with his problems and spend time with his family, he only drank more. Eventually, he was fired and forced to seek other employment. One night, after drinking heavily, tears streaming down his face, Randy's father confessed to Randy details to the incident he had kept from him all those years. The body of the woman who arrived at his house was found a couple of days later after the incident. She had been from a town several miles away and had been missing for a few weeks, but the autopsy reported that she had been only dead for a few days. Randy believed that the creatures he saw had controlled her body from inside while she was still alive. Most of her bones had been broken and they were all completely drained of bone marrow. Randy's brother wasn't found until a month later, his corpse torn to shreds. His mother's body was found two towns over a week after that. Her body was in the same shape as that other woman. Before Randy could say anything more, one of the guys at the party came up from behind one of the girls to scare her. She screamed, causing most of the people in the room to jump a foot in the air. Suddenly realizing what had happened, everyone started laughing. Everyone, except for Randy. The room quickly fell silent as everyone looked to see that Randy had left without a word. Kevin rushed after him, and I followed. When we caught up to Randy, he was already a block away. Randy, Kevin said. What's up with you? Was it the story? That's not actually what happened, right? Wasn't it just a story? Randy just shook his head. Just shut up and leave me alone. I'm going home. We tried to calm him down, but he just ignored us. We went back to the party, and I never saw Randy again. Everyone at the party didn't seem fazed by the story, assuming it just to be that, a story. And who could blame them? It sounded ridiculous. About a year later, I saw Randy's obituary in the paper. He was apparently dealing with depression and had committed suicide. If I had any belief in his story before, it was now gone. It must have been fueled by some sort of delusion from his depression, or perhaps it was a side effect of the medication he was taking. Randy's father drank himself to death a few days later. The toll of losing most of his family must have been too much for him. I don't know what happened to Randy's sister. Eight months later, I saw a report on the local news. The body of a hiker was found on a nearby nature trail. He had been missing for a few weeks, but had only recently died. I found myself hoping and praying that my suspicions were just paranoia. I had dismissed the story, but now a creeping suspicion came back. That's when they described the body as having numerous wounds, the same as Randy had described. This was apparently the second case in two months, but after a third, they stopped. Not much more about the story was covered. There was some further speculation, and a lot of rumors started going around. The more rumors I heard, the more I thought of Rainey's story. Was it true after all? Were those little demented monsters actually real? One night last summer, I was on a walk with my girlfriend. She likes to take the scenic route, so we ended up walking through the woods. It wasn't a deep forest or anything. It was just a small nature trail. While we were walking, talking, and laughing, I could have sworn I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Something, or should I say, many things, seemed to be looking at us. I pointed my flashlight at them, but the eyes disappeared. That's when I truly began hoping my eyes were playing tricks on me. I thought I saw someone lying in the shrubs, motionless. I became afraid and looked away. I wanted to say something and even felt the urge to run, but I didn't want to frighten my girlfriend. I didn't want to know if what I saw was really there, and I began denying to myself that what I saw was real. Even so, I had to get out of there. I claimed I wasn't feeling well, and I went home. I'm not sure what to think anymore. 
I have never seen these things Randy was talking about up close, but I'm still afraid of being alone. The woods now frighten me. I hope my eyes were playing tricks on me that night, but I still hate the idea of being alone somewhere where nobody can hear me scream. About a year ago, I moved my family and I to a new home out in the woods in Tennessee. I wanted to be brief here, but I need to get this off my chest, and after looking into this matter a little more, I have a lot more details that I think will paint a clear picture in the end, so please bear with me. The nights here can be extremely loud. Between the crickets, the tree frogs, and the cicadas, it can almost be deafening. One night, not too long after we moved in, I'd forgotten something in my car and headed outside to get it. The first thing that struck me as odd was that my dog wouldn't go outside with me. My dog goes everywhere with me as I'm her whole world, but not this night. As I held the door open, she looked out and then looked up at me like no. So, I walked out and shut the door behind me. The second thing that caught me off guard was that there was not a peep. It was dead silent. I still shrugged this off and walked down my front steps and headed to my car. When I'd gotten about ten feet from my car, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I felt as though something was watching me. I looked around but saw nothing. After I reached in my car for what I'd forgotten to grab earlier, I had this feeling like something was moving towards me. I took a step back and checked around me. All of a sudden, I heard one of the hedges next to me that lined the walkway to our front door rattle. At first, I thought it was a rabbit that I'd spooked, as I had seen one just earlier in the day right where this was. A few seconds later, I heard the sound of a large rock landing a few feet away from me. It hit the walkway and bounced into a shrub. I drew my gun and called out, and said whoever that this was is about to be shot. After a few seconds of nothing, I began to think that maybe this was some local teenagers messing with the new people. I holstered my sidearm, turned and started walking back to my front door. Almost as soon as I turned towards my house, I heard this deep, panting sound. It sounded like a huge dog, but what made me nope back to my front door was that it sounded like it was right behind me. I leaped up onto my porch, turned, and drew my gun again, expecting something right there. But again, there was nothing. A couple of weeks later, I was on my porch at night, sitting on a bench with my wife. She got up and walked inside to get something, and as soon as she shut the door, I heard that panting sound again. I couldn't see anything, yet this sounded like it was right on top of me. The sound was coming from everywhere and it was very loud. Again, I couldn't see anything so I noped back inside my house. Now at this point, I was questioning moving here, but after nothing else really happening, I let it go. A month or so later, it was a really rainy and stormy night. This was around 9pm and my wife and I enjoy listening to the rain and talking about how relaxing the rain is. Me, growing up in Oregon, loved the rain and for the past 10 years we lived in Vegas where it would dump the entire year of rain in a day, then be bone dry for the rest of the year. For my wife who grew up in Nevada, rain was such a rare thing, she loved going outside and watching the rain. So, for us, this is an enjoyable experience. Except this night in particular, things took a weird turn. As we were sitting there talking about the rain and relaxing, my wife stops me and said, Did you hear that? No, what did you hear? I asked. I swear it sounded like a small child calling for help out in the woods beside our house, she said. No, I didn't hear anything. I replied. After a few moments of us listening intently, she said, There it is again. I didn't hear a thing, sweetie. Are you sure you're not just hearing things? I told her. 
She looked at me offended that I didn't hear anything and said, No, I'm positive. How could you not hear that? It was our son. I think he's out there and got lost. No, he's in the house sleeping on the couch, I replied. We then both looked through the blinds that were open right behind us, and we could see all of our children laying there. That's so weird. I swear it sounds like our son, my wife said. Well, it isn't him. He's right there. Besides, I don't hear anything, I told her. She then stands up and says, Wow, he's really crying out for help. I need to go look for him. Now at this point, if you knew my wife, you would know she's absolutely creeped out by the woods and wouldn't be caught dead walking into them during daylight, much less at night during a storm. I grabbed her hand and said, I've been listening intently and there's absolutely nobody calling out for help. You need to stay here. At this point, I'm getting worried about her. She was acting completely out of character, not to mention that at this time, she was eight months pregnant with our baby daughter. She then says, what if there's some child out there lost in the woods? Well, first off, I would be able to hear them too. Secondly, there are no other kids around here for miles, and the odds of them being lost a hundred feet from our house that's lit up like a Christmas tree is nil, I told her. I know, but what if it's a kid, she says. Before I could say anything else, she stands up and starts walking towards the stairs. I jumped up and grabbed her hand again and said, No, you're not. Get in the house. I don't know what's going on, but you need to go inside. She then complies and we both go inside. I didn't know what that was, but it freaked me out. A few months after this, just as it was getting dark outside, I heard the front door to our house open and I got up to investigate. We have autistic six-year-old twins and we have the door set up so that they can't open it without us there. So to hear this sound, it could only be my wife. What was weird was the fact that she usually doesn't go outside without saying something to me. I walked out the front and saw my wife walking down our private road towards the drive on the side of our house. I asked her what she's doing, and she says she was sitting on the back patio and kept hearing a baby crying out in the woods. I said, seriously, and you just decided to walk off into the woods and investigate? She then looks out to the woods and says, see, there it is again, and I can't hear anything, but what I did notice is that it was completely silent out again. I told her just like before, the chances of a baby being out in the woods outside of our house is slim, and that she needed to get back into the house. What if someone left the baby out there? She said. Well, if that were true, I would hear it too, I replied. Now at this point, I was really starting to worry about my wife's mental health. I actually asked her to see a psychiatrist, and she did. Now, looking back, I feel really bad about this, knowing what I do. A key to this moment was that my wife had just given birth to a baby girl a month before. A few days after this, we're out front on the porch. It's early evening, and I just mowed the lawn this day, and our three-year-old son was riding around in his little car in front of the house. Now, he knows that he's not allowed outside of a certain area that we mapped off. He loves playing outside, but with the road being 50 feet from our front porch, we have to be careful, as a lot of boaters will fly through after drinking all day on their boats. As we were talking, we're both keeping an eye on him. A neighbor drives by and stops to say hi for a second. This interaction took approximately 8 seconds, as all they said were, How are things? good, we replied, and he told us he would stop by later as his wife got something for the kids. We said, okay, great, and he drove off. I looked over where our son was, and he was gone. I called out his name and ran over to the side of our house, and I could hear his car on our side drive. I scolded him for leaving the area, and he said something in his three-year-old gibberish, and pointed to the woods behind our house. 
You have five seconds to get back to the front of the house or else, I told him. And he adamantly pointed back in the direction of the woods and kept trying to tell me something. I looked off in the direction of the woods and just assumed he saw a deer or a squirrel or something and wanted to see it up close. I walked him back up to the front of the house and he cried the whole way there. He got really upset that I wouldn't let him go into the woods. But I just wrote this off as him being curious, and most three-year-old boys are. Now this instance isn't isolated, as our twins have done something similar but not quite as extreme as this. There have been nights where we had just laid down for the night and heard a loud bang on the side of our house on the wall behind our bed. It was so loud that I jumped up and looked out the window. Our floodlight had come on, but I could see nothing. Now the weird part about this is that our bedroom sits about 12 feet from the ground level as we have a full-size basement that's cinder block. I put on my slippers and grabbed one of my 12-gauge shotguns and walked outside to investigate. It was dead silent again. The floodlight that's on the side of the house had clicked off at this point, so I walked over to the end of the deck and shined my light around the yard. There was nothing. I walked around the house and shined the light around intently. As I approached the back side of my house, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I felt like something was watching me. I shined the light up in the trees, but again, nothing. I rounded the corner and the first thing I noticed was that my three dogs that were in their area weren't making a peep. Now our dogs have no filter and will bark at anyone and everyone. This includes me, so to see them all hiding with their tails between their legs, not making a peep, really had me worried. As I kept walking, all of a sudden the crickets and frogs started making sounds again. It was as if someone had clicked a switch. I walked back into the house and told my wife that I hadn't seen anything. She shrugged and said okay, as long as our dogs were okay. Due to the circumstances that night, I decided to let the dogs in and sleep with us. This very same thing has happened on all four exterior walls of our house. It's random and annoying, but just like this instance, every time there's nothing going on outside. There have also been times where we were sitting in the house and as I was watching a movie, my wife walked over to me and said, Did you call me? I told her no, and she said she swears she heard me call her name in her ear. She said it was definitely my voice, but she didn't understand because it was so close, and I was a good 20 feet away from her in my recliner. The important part of this was that she was sitting at the table doing something, and the slider to the backyard was open behind her. Now, our patio sits about 20 feet off the ground and is like a balcony as it has no stair access outside. I think the previous owner built it for barbecuing. There have been several instances where she would say she heard someone whisper in her ear, but she couldn't make out the sound. Again, I kept thinking she was going crazy, but as you will see, I think all of this is tied into this final moment where things are revealed. The last thing I want to mention before we get into what just happened is that I have a shooting range built behind my workshop on the opposite side of our property, next to the main road. It's kind of on a downslope, but it works perfectly for what I need it for. The range itself cuts straight into the woods, going about 100 yards or so. When you're at the downrange, you have woods surrounding you on all sides, except back up to my shop. I have to say, it has always felt creepy when I'm dealing with my targets or mowing. When you're down there, it feels like you're miles from anyone. One day, around 5 in the evening, I was sighting in a new rifle scope. The sun was still up, but was starting to fade soon, so I knew this was going to be the final test. Up until this point, nothing really happened while I was making my multiple trips downrange other than this feeling of uneasiness. As I got downrange, I kept feeling like someone or something was watching me. I looked around but didn't see anything. As I was placing stickers over my previous shots, I heard something big off to the side of me. 
It sounded like a large branch had snapped off a tree. Now, if you've been in the Tennessee woods, you will know that a lot of branches fall off trees randomly out of nowhere, so this is nothing new. Except this time, it was very loud and sounded like fresh, strong wood, if that makes any sense. I turned and looked, but again couldn't see anything. I started walking back up to my rifle, and I swear I heard someone right behind me. I turned around, but again saw nothing. As I started to walk, I heard this deep growl. It was really deep and loud. And what's worse is that it was all around me. I turned around, facing the range, and started walking backwards. The thought of some rabbit dog charging out of the bushes had me freaked out, so running wasn't a good idea. I slowly walked backwards up the hill to my rifle, but nothing happened. I grabbed my rifle and sprayed the target with rapid fire, hoping to scare off whatever was stalking me. I left 10 rounds in the mag and grabbed my rifle bag and quickly walked back up to the house. I never told my wife about this as I didn't want her to freak out. Fast forward about a year later from when we moved in and my niece is staying with us as a live-in nanny to earn money over summer break from college. We were on our way back from the store and about a mile from our house, I saw two eyes reflecting the headlights coming from a white tree on the side of the road just ahead. It had caught my attention because they were higher than a deer, but also a different color and size. Just as I had said, what is that? And squinted, they vanished. I made a comment that it was almost as if it had known I could see its eyes, and it moved. The color was kind of golden and green, but they resembled the mannerisms of a large cat as they felt ominous. It's hard to explain, but I shrugged it off as we were passing the tree and saw nothing. A few moments later, we arrived at the house. As we're getting bags out of the car, my three-year-old came bolting out of the house, excited to see me. As I was waiting to help her carry in her bags, I heard my dog growl. I looked in the direction. She was looking at my neighbor's property across the street. Now, what I saw kept me up all night. Up until this point, I've always been skeptical as I've never seen anything with my own two eyes, even with what had happened to me the year prior. I still had my doubts that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Now my street is kind of a spread out neighborhood. Each house sits on several acres and at the end of our road is Kentucky Lake. My neighbor's house sits adjacent to my house on about an acre lot. Directly in front of my house is a wall of woods, and directly behind my house is several thousand acres of untouched forest. As I was looking across the street to my neighbor's property, I saw a large dark figure between the trees at first. The movement caught me off guard as it looked like something big moved quickly on all fours. Then, when it came out into clear view, it stood up and walked like a man. At first, I didn't know what to make of it. It was very tall, but what was strange about it was the distance it was covering and the fact that when it was in front of his shed, I swear I could see through it. It was clearly walking quickly, but moving faster than any person could at a sprint. More importantly, there was no sound. It was like it was phasing in and out of reality as it moved. I said, what the hell is that? and realized that it was looking directly at us. It had moved at an angle away from us to minimize its time out in the open, and moving as quickly as it could while still being silent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I realized that whatever it was, was stalking us. I told my niece to get in the house now, and I grabbed my son and booked it inside. I grabbed my AR-15 with a short scope, and came back outside to see my niece still grabbing stuff out of her car. Knowing I told her firmly and clearly to get in the house, her disregard to my command annoyed me, but still I watched over her without saying a word. As she was slowly walking, she turned towards the woods across the street from my house, 
and suddenly bolted for the house. She ran up the steps in a panicked state. I asked her what she saw, and her face was pale as a ghost. She said, I heard something big in the woods walking loudly on the leaves, and when I turned toward it, I heard a deep, guttural growl. I asked her why she didn't come when I told her, and she said she thought I was talking to my son. I told her what I had seen, and she wanted to get a closer look to see if she could see something. I told her that it was not a good idea, and she went anyway. As she was walking down the walkway, I heard the sound of dry leaves crunching in the woods across the street. I told her to stop and come take the flashlight. Now at this point, she's about six foot away from my wife's SUV. As she turned and started walking back to me, I caught a glimpse of something gray and hairy bolt from behind the SUV back across the street into the woods. My porch is a raised porch, and our SUV is about six foot five tall, and whatever this was cleared it about 45 feet in what looked like a single jump. It moved like lightning. Whatever it was, it wanted my niece. It jumped behind the car out of my line of sight and was waiting for her. She still doubted my warnings and grabbed the flashlight and walked back toward the car. As she entered my driveway, she stopped dead in her tracks and leaned forward as if she could see something. I asked her what she saw. She turned and ran back up on the porch with a terrified look on her face, saying, Nope, over and over again. She said it was a figure hiding inside of a tree and that she saw its eyes. I asked her what they looked like, and all she could say was that they looked dull red at first, but as she got closer, they looked dead. I said, what do you mean dead? And she said that the pupils looked gray, kind of like the way eyes look when they go blind. She said it was really dark gray, and she swears she could see through it almost like a dark cloud. She wanted to go out again and took a step down the stairs, and as she did, it revealed itself from the tree. I said, get inside, and I went in and locked the door. It looked like a tall human-shaped being. It was really tall and looked ominous as hell. The next morning, we did a height comparison to the tree limb we saw it stand over, and we put its height to around 9 feet tall, and its eyes were about 6 inches apart. At this point, I don't know what this thing was. After doing some research, I think this thing was a glimmer man or crawler. I looked to see if there had been any other sightings in Benton County, but nothing. More importantly, I swear it would face in and out, almost like a shadow person, but bigger and more obvious. One of the things that makes this fit is that it can communicate telepathically. This explains why everyone was hearing something that nobody else could hear. Secondly, it has a playback-like communication, so when I heard a dog panting, it was probably one of my dogs it had heard. My wife was actually hearing our son crying for help, as he had recently fell and cried for help. The baby crying would be our newborn baby, who she'd given birth to recently, and it must have heard me calling my wife's name and kept telepathically calling my wife's name with my voice. Another thing is that my niece had said that night was the night she felt compelled to go back outside. She said she'd felt this thing was communicating with her somehow, and it wanted her to go back outside. The more I read about this thing, the more everything that's been happening over the past year makes sense. One thing that I find extra convincing is that down the roads towards the lake, there's a property that's cordoned off with barbed wire, and there's a wall of forest with no driveway. A lot of the property down our road is underdeveloped owned land, and on one of the trees, there's this large old sign that says, Screamer lives here, with an arrow pointing back into the woods. Now I have to admit, when I first saw the sign, I laughed, thinking maybe the owner screamed at trespassers who entered his property, and teenagers put up the sign to mess with him. But when I did a satellite search of our neighborhood, 
That entire section of road has no houses or trails or anything. It's just pure forest for as far as the eye can see. One of the things that this thing is said to do is make a loud scream when threatened. Now that you understand my story, I doubt this is the ending. The next question is what can we do? I don't want my wife or kids to disappear one day. And if there's more than one of these sightings out there, this really makes the missing 411 make a whole lot of sense. I feel perplexed and scared as to what I can do. I wanted to update. Thank you all for the support. Unfortunately, we can't afford to get a camera system or trail cameras that many have recommended. I'm a disabled veteran, and I just lost my business due to the lockdowns. We're struggling to afford the basic amenities currently. One night when my niece arrived, we went out on the front porch to welcome her. I did notice something that looked like a face staring at me, but what was weird was that as I was staring at it, it moved back into the shadow without moving, if that makes any sense. The one thing that I would like to add in this update that I hadn't thought was connected was about two to three weeks ago. My wife and I had been in an argument about something silly. She decided to walk into our woods to clear her head. I was on the back patio when I noticed her walking down our shooting range. I asked her where she was going, and she said, to cool off. Now, I knew the chances of something happening to her were slim, but I found it odd that she chose to go into the woods rather than simply walking down the road. I quickly got dressed and went to go down to try and bring her back. I went to the end of the range and called her name. After a few minutes of calling out, I heard nothing. Not a peep or a twig or anything. Now the weird part is that it is impossible to move around in these woods without making any sound, especially for her. I was worried that she was walking too far, but I had to get back into the house as our children were alone. It freaked me out because it was as if she had vanished. I went back into the house and debated calling someone, but I figured I would give her a bit more time. I went to the back patio and waited. After about an hour, I started to get really worried. I called out her name again and decided that I would call if she hadn't returned at the hour and a half mark. After another 20 minutes went by, she came walking back out of the woods. Angry that she'd worried me so much, yet also relieved, I asked her what she was thinking. She said, what, as she walked back up into the house. She came in and looked at me like I was crazy. I said, did you not hear me calling out to you? She said she only heard me once, and she replied, and this is where it gets crazy. She said, I've only been gone for 10 to 15 minutes. Why are you freaking out? When I told her that she'd been gone for an hour and 20 minutes, she didn't believe me. She also said that when she went down there, she didn't go very far. But when she turned around, she started walking and got worried that she was lost. She said she didn't recognize where she was, but something told her to keep walking. She said it felt strange and that the air felt different. When she came back out of the woods, she was relieved to see the house. Now, the part that upsets me the most about this was that where she said she was was impossible. I was literally standing 20 to 30 feet away from that spot. If she had been there, not only would I have seen her, but she could have talked to me in a normal voice. My concern is that you can see the house from this spot, and how she felt lost is mind-boggling. I don't know what this was. I thought that again she was just losing her mind. I planned to go back where she was with her to prove that you can see the house from there, but I want her to show me exactly where all she went, as well as talk me through everything. An update on June 24th, 2022. Weird things kept happening. My three-year-old son was playing on the back patio a few feet away from us, and all of a sudden, the dogs inside jump and start barking as one of our dogs, Duke, that's on the patio with him, comes bolting into the door. I jump up to see what's going on and my son's pointing at the tree line saying, 
werewolf daddy, werewolf. Now my son loves watching videos of werewolves for toddlers for some reason. I would normally put this off as nothing, but if you saw the look on his face, you would know that he was serious. Plus, with the way my dogs reacted, he had to have seen something. I pulled out my phone and began recording. He kept saying, Daddy, look, werewolf in the bushes. I tell him I can't see anything, but I can hear something really big in the leaves. An update on September 7th, 2022. My niece quit. She said she couldn't handle all the stuff that's been happening to her. Everything was fine for a while. We kept indoors for the most part. We went out on the porch one night with a flashlight and camera, hoping to catch something. We kept hearing things in the brush, which could be anything. After a while of not seeing anything, we went back inside. I said my prayers and then slept like a baby. My niece, however, did not. She woke up late the next day and seemed a bit jumpy. I asked her what's wrong. She said that she didn't sleep well as something was outside her window. It took a bit of prodding to get her to talk about it. She said she could hear something big outside her window. But every time she looked, she couldn't see anything. She said she heard weird noises that she couldn't describe. She came out to the living room to see if I was still up, but I was fast asleep. She decided to go back to her room and go to sleep watching YouTube on her phone. She said she was almost asleep when she felt something standing right behind her. She turned around and there was nothing. She said she kept having that feeling, but brushed it off as her imagination. That was until about 3 a.m. when she woke up. She said she had her phone on the windowsill playing a video. She had the same feeling as before, but this time it was very intense. Like whatever it was, it wanted to devour her. She turned around quickly and saw what looked like a shadow disappear into the wall in the blink of an eye. She told me this kept happening until she passed out late in the morning. I told her that it was weird as we've never experienced anything like that in the house before. We have had weird things happen, like things disappear for a while, then reappear days or months later in the exact spot they last were. She said it felt like whatever this was, it made her feel like it wanted to hurt her. I told her to keep me updated and let me know if anything else happens. A few days later, she asks if she can use the hot tub that's out back. I explain that it's off and we can't afford to heat it. When we go over to it, I open it to look inside. To my disbelief, not only is it on, but the water looks great, minus a little cleanup that needed to be done. As I'm walking around, all of a sudden, I hear this really loud thump behind me, like a log falling onto the ground or a really big boulder hitting the ground. Imagine an engine block falling 20 feet onto soft soil. It made me jump. I turned around but couldn't see anything as the brush was too thick. I helped her work on the spa. Then she says she's going to go inside and get changed so she can get in. I look around and realize that it's getting dark outside and I really don't want to be out here. I bend over to work on getting the filter cleaned out and I hear what sounds like something big snapping branches and charging at me. It made me jump then run to the back door. I turned around to see what it was and nothing. I walk back into the house and walk up the stairs. I tell her I heard something out there and she looked at me for a minute, then said, Well, I want to get in and relax. She asks if I can leave the back patio door open, so if she needs me, she can call. But according to her, she enjoyed the spa without incident. Every day, I notice her getting more anxious and less willing to talk about it. She says every night something new happens to her, but when I ask her to elaborate, she would refuse. A few nights later, I walk out on the porch and notice it's dead quiet again. I ask her to come out on the porch with me, but she says she's tired and wants to call her boyfriend and go to bed. My wife gets up early and takes care of the kids, and it's my job to handle the night shift, so she's in bed at this point. I decide I don't have the guts to do this alone, 
so I put on a movie and relax in my recliner. I end up falling asleep, then wake up at 3am to a noise coming from my niece's room. It sounds like a deep voice, and I knock on the door. I call out several times, but get nothing in response. I figure it must be her video and decide to let it be. I head to bed, and just as I start to pass out, another loud bang happens. I wake up to hear what sounds like something skittering on the wall outside of my bedroom. Understand that this is way up in the air and physically impossible. I look out the window but don't see anything. After going out and checking on this bang multiple times over the last year and seeing nothing, I decide to forget it and go back to sleep. The next day my niece comes out and tells me that she had the shadow thing happen again, except this time she left her light on. She said she woke up to getting that feeling again. She said that when she opened her eyes, she could see an extremely tall, shadowy figure standing over the top of her. She said it was moving closer to her, and just as she started to see the details of its face, she turned around in panic, but nothing was there. She said the eyes haunted her, but didn't want to elaborate any further. The next morning, for the first time ever, my niece is up bright and early. I noticed she looked anxious as she told me that she's headed home for the 4th of July weekend and will be back on Tuesday. I ask her if she's okay and she says yes and quickly walks out the door. Later that day, I get a call from my sister telling me that she won't be coming back. I ask her if everything's alright and she says yes, that she just wants to enjoy the rest of her summer. A little while later, I get a call from my niece telling me that she doesn't want to work here anymore as she can't handle the anxiety from whatever is out there. She doesn't elaborate more than that but whatever has been going on in her room has her petrified. I checked on her room and noticed that she's been sleeping with one of the windows wide open. The window is perfectly accessible from the outside. I don't know what's been going on, but whatever it is, looks like it could have been coming into the room. Fast forward to the 4th of July. I do fireworks out front of the property by the road facing the woods. Due to what's been happening at night, I decided to do them prior to it getting dark outside. We do our fireworks, and just as it starts getting dark, I get everyone inside. After a couple of hours, I remember that my hose is still on the ground and laying out by the road. I head out to clean everything up and put the hose away. While I'm doing this, I notice it's dead silent again, minus the sound of the fireworks in the distance. The hairs on the back of my neck go up and I get the feeling that I'm being watched again. I hurry and coil the hose and ran back into the house. I swear, I'm starting to wonder if it's just my mind playing tricks on me at this point. Lost in Wyoming, part one. Wyoming's a strange place. Vast and empty, yet filled with ruthless wildlife and nature. Even the most mundane can become the most terrifying when you're alone in the woods. Ready to get lost? This is based on a true story. Only names have been changed for privacy reasons. Part 1. Light in the Sky The year was 2020. I was jobless and without a care in the world. Unemployment checks were coming in, and for the first time in my young life, I had enough money to put down on a brand new, shiny car. I went to the dealership and, pretty much, chose the first car I saw, which would be a 2008 RAV4. Mind you, I know it's not a brand new car, but to me, it was a car made of solid gold. I'd never owned anything with less than 200,000 miles at that point. It was freeing to buy a brand new car with no problems. I'd gotten a clean bill of health from my mechanic and figured there was no other way to break it in than to go on a road trip. My old friend had been car camping across the U.S. at that point, 
and we made a plan to meet up in Wyoming for the first real outdoor excursion. I packed a sleeping bag, a tent, and any other gear I could fit and drove my way out to the Medicine Bow National Forest to meet my friend. The drive there was an experience itself. No cell service, empty roads, only us and the dry, dense trees. It was nearing the middle of June as we drove our rigs out into the middle of the forest. Giant snowdrifts still lay on most of the dirt roads, making some entirely impassable. But the glacier lilies and great hyacinths were slowly peeping their heads out and the blades of fresh grass crept through the patches of ice and snow. The forest was still reawakening from its chilly slumber, and it made the whole landscape that much more ethereal. The birds were singing, the bugs began to buzz after a long winter. We drove through the trees north as far as we could, passing through large swaths of burn scar that became more and more apparent as we pressed on. The landscape was still beautiful, but there was something unnerving about those dead trees and the way they creaked in total silence. Light started to fade and we landed in a camp spot that was partial burn scar, most likely from the fire decades ago. The sing trees gave way to a breathtaking view of the alpine mesa. We lit a small fire and set up camp as we caught up with each other's lives. It was pitch black as we sat over the campfire, roasting brats and laughing over good old memories. When we saw it, it started as a sliver of light on the horizon, thin and bright. It looked like a car that had its brights on far, far away. But the thing was, we were on one of the last accessible roads. There were no other roads that direction, only dead fallen trees for miles. But the light got brighter. What is that? I finally exclaimed. My friend looked over his shoulder and was just as bewildered as I was. It was so bright and it appeared to be coming closer and brighter. Suddenly, the thought of a forest fire flashed through my mind. I'm sure the same idea went through my friend's head as we both locked eyes shot up from our seats. The light was captivating, hypnotizing almost, but time was short. We scurried around the camp in a frenzy trying to track down our things. The light became larger and brighter. I had never seen anything so bright in pure darkness before. As it grew in size, so did my fear. Was it another camper driving aimlessly through the forest? A fire? A bomb? The end of the world? In a strange moment, we both stopped and looked towards the light. The silver had turned into a blinding cascade of light, and it grew. The trees around us lit up, and their strange, scraggly shadows were cast down upon the ground. We looked onward, bathed in the light of this great bright thing. What in the hell was it? With the silence, up it crept. That was when we realized it was the moon. A full moon. The fullest I've ever seen, I'd say. We laughed hysterically as the moon rose, teasing ourselves for getting so paranoid. Spirits returned to normal as we settled in for a chilly night of sleep. To this day, I've never seen a full moon so big and so bright as the one that evening, and I think it's pretty silly for one person to mistake the moon for a forest fire. But for two people to do it, that's a little bizarre. Maybe it was a warning, a foreshadowing of strange things to come. At least, maybe that's how I should have seen it at that time, if I'd known what lay ahead of me. Part 2 It was a chilly June morning. 
I awakened with a slight mist on my breath and wiggled out of my sleeping bag. We couldn't have gotten off to a better start. It was a beautiful early summer day. The sun was shining with only a few small puffy clouds speckled across the big blue sky. My friend, Sam as we will now refer to him, and I picked up our remaining gear and got back on the rough back roads of the Medicine Bow National Forest. Today we were heading even more north to a large but secluded reservoir in the middle of the forest. We had lost most of our Google Map data as we'd gotten farther in, and both of our cars were without GPS and touchscreen. But, as I learned from a former analog camping escapades, you gotta just look for the big brown signs, and that'll usually lead you the right way. I didn't think twice about not having a physical map with us. Hindsight's 2020. It was strange having the roads all to ourselves. You would think that the place would be infested with four-wheelers and happy campers. But the mix of the 2020 pandemic and an extra wet winter left scant others on the trail. The further we went, the less people we saw, until eventually we hadn't come across another person in several hours. The roads had gotten progressively worse as we drove on. Large, muddy ruts turned into slushy potholes that would explode into a rainbow of ice shards with each tire rotation. I followed closely behind Sam's forewarner, rolling along in my stock summer tires as best I could in the ever-deepening snow. But there came a point in the road where even Sam second-guessed getting across. There were a few logs lodged into the drift to help with tractions. Even so, it was still a good three feet of slushy wet snow. Sam approached cautiously, but with a few spins of the tires, he made it across the dirt. Now, it was my turn. Call it stupidity, inexperience, what you will. I was determined to make it over that damn pile of snow. I didn't want to come off as that fearful little girl that couldn't do tough outdoor shit. And so once Sam was across, I put the pedal to the metal and gunned my little rap four across the snow. I heard my car revving and groaning as I pushed on, only to come to a sputtering stop in the middle of a snowdrift. Tired as I might, I couldn't roll forward. I couldn't go back. My car had sunken into the soft snow, and I was stuck in the equivalent of cold quickstand. Now, we weren't totally unprepared. Sam had a couple of toe straps. The challenge was finding a way to attach them onto my car and drag it out. My hands were frozen and scratched from the ice as we dug with any shovel-type instruments we could find. It took some time, but inch by inch, we wriggled my car free. Not without damage, though. We had ripped off my undercarriage cover in the process, and who knew what else couldn't be seen with the naked eye. I was pissed, mostly at myself for being such an idiot. Not only had I damaged my brand new car, but the road was now totally inaccessible. After our laborious snow digging operation, the piles of slush and mud made it impossible for either of us to turn back the way we came. Thankfully, we were pressing on north using a different route, but with each mile we drove, I felt less and less confident. If there was this big old snow pile on one of the main back roads, who's to say how the other roads would look further on? We arrived at the reservoir by mid-afternoon, hungry and irritable. Our thoughts soon melted away with the summer sun and waterside views. The reservoir wouldn't officially open for the season due to COVID, so we were met with empty beaches and the soft sounds of the waves on the shore. It was peaceful and very much needed after spending the last few hours digging my car out of the gold snow. 
Little did we know there were clouds on the horizon. Dark ones. The white puffballs of the morning had turned an ominous black, and a chill wind had swiftly picked up. Something was coming. Part 3. The Storm We sat on the beach for what seemed like ages, simply absorbing the last 24 hours. It's crazy how time can stretch when you're out in the wild. The trek out the night before, the car getting stuck. Things that would feel so mundane or mildly inconvenient in day-to-day -day life felt like a momentous event out here in the middle of nowhere. The calm waves became louder, more rushed as they lapped against the eroded rocks of the shore on which we sat. The summer sun slid behind the clouds, and the balmy 70-degree day dropped a quick 30 degrees within the span of us walking from the beach back to the cars. Like a whisper, a single snowflake fell on my windshield as I shut my driver door, and I knew we were in for one hell of a storm. As a Colorado child, I was raised to laugh in the face of snow, especially in June but our measly storms were no match to those of Wyoming. The few flakes fattened and fell in large clumps as we traversed our way into the trees. Our route out was to take less than an hour and got us just outside the small town of Centennial. Maybe if we went quickly, we could outrun the storm. Maybe, if we were lucky, we would find a little hotel for the night and wait out the cold weather. Optimism is futile in the wild. Practicalism is a much better option. We drove on and the snow got worse. I squinted and white-knuckled my wheel while I navigated the rutted road that was coated in fresh powder. Sam was only a few feet ahead of me, but I was having trouble keeping track of him. When heavy snow falls that fast, it's like trying to stare through the static on a television. It had been just over an hour when Sam came to a sudden stop. It took me a second to see why, but smack dead in front of us was a snowdrift on the road that was at least ten feet tall. Our way out was now impossible. It snowed harder. Sam ran out from his car to my window. We had to make a plan, and fast. We had no GPS, no maps, no cell phone service, and now a zero way out in the middle of a summer blizzard, by which we were completely unprepared for. Our best bet was to head back towards the reservoir, and even now, that was an hour away, and all of the already foreign roads were now covered in a blanket of snow. We did our best to retrace our tracks, but we're losing daylight fast. We'd go down a road, certain it was the way back, only to be met with a dead end of snowdrift. Over and over we'd try a road dead in and turn back around, bringing my gas tank down to less than half full. Finally, with a stroke of luck, we found a familiar looking clearing with a road that we were pretty sure would take us back to the reservoir. It was almost dark and the snow was now impossible to drive in with my summer tires. So, knowing we were possibly on the right track, we finally pulled off to make camp. As I put my car in park, I looked out the window and onto a group of nearby moose stampeding through the clearing. The snow swirled around their black silhouettes as they pounded towards the forest. The silence after was deafening. We were all alone out here. As you would imagine, we weren't expecting a winter storm in the middle of June, and I wasn't prepared for it either. Back then, I was still relying on a Walmart camping setup, and that was maybe good for sleeping in the 40 to 50 degrees range. The heaviest jackets I had were a sweatshirt and a raincoat, no gloves. My cheap butane stove barely lit in the cold temperatures, and food supplies were dwindling fast. 
I couldn't keep my car running for heat because we had no extra gasoline and no idea how long it would take to find a new route out to asphalt. The cold set in, then reality. I felt broken as I started to shiver. The epic camping trip was turning out to be a lot more epic than expected, and I was starting to get scared. Sam was faring better than I, but still had a tinge of anxiety in his manner. Our way out was blocked. The way we came in was blocked, even more so with the fresh snow. There were plenty of roads around us, but we were effectively stuck in a labyrinth without a map. There was no way to tell which of the roads would be blocked by mounds of snow and which would lead us out if we could get out. We were lost in Wyoming. It was now pitch black outside. The wind picked up and screamed as I huddled in the back of my car, trying to build a makeshift tent out of the extra blankets to stay warm. The snow was stacking up. I did not have a good feeling about this. I think the area ended up getting about a foot total from start to finish. For the Google Map enthusiasts, I can't guarantee this is the exact route and spot as it's been a few years. As for the way back to the reservoir, I really can't say. I was so focused on not getting stuck that I left a lot of navigating to Sam. We definitely did not go back the way we came and got lost on a few dead-end roads, forcing us to turn around a few times. All forest roads started looking the same after a while. It's a problem. I know we eventually landed here because I remember the clearing so distinctly after a lifetime of trees. Part 4 and Part 5 to be continued.